the Forty or Tea podcast. It's going a bit, a bit, bit further into. I mean, did you have any difficulties when it came to parenting with me? And I guess, like, was it was there any like individuals, any kind of, I don't know, speakers or role models or um, parenting groups which kind of informed your opinion? Because I feel like a lot of parents nowadays, especially with you know the the types of practices that a lot of autistic people um, feel very negatively towards and uh, and don't agree with. Um, whereas my my experience of parenting fr- from your side and also your um, style of teaching, it seems to be a lot more kind of holistic and a lot more individualized mm-hmm. as opposed to like trying to fit everyone into programs and mm-hmm. setting like very stringent mm-hmm. milestones and things like that so yeah difficulties perhaps with parenting me about certain things and what kind of informed that okay so when um when we were leading up to diagnosis and diagnosis i read and read and read <laughs> everything that was out there and um i think one of the biggest thing, the biggest um influences was reading Anna Kennedy's book Uh, uh, Not Stupid Mm -hmm. which was an amazing book if you ever get to read that. I'm an ambassador Um, to Anna Kennedy if you want to go check out her work. I was very pleased that 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 happened. It was like coming full circle really. Yeah. And also uh, Tony Atwood Mm. uh, because he particularly looked at Asperger's which Thomas was diagnosed with at the time We've come under one umbrella of autism, but that was a diagnosis, so that's what we looked at. I also read a lot by Wen Lawson, who was Wen, Wendy Lawson, who um, did a lot of work on relationships and kind of sexual health as well, because I knew obviously Tom was going to go into puberty, kind mm-hmm. of there would be other things coming up. Um, pardon the pun. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> Sorry. You're the worst. Like you, you and Dad, you're the worst for that kind of stuff. <laughs> Must be something about your generation or something. Yeah, swiftly moving on. Go, okay, yeah, so, go for it. Yeah. So when, um, <laughs> so when, um, uh, I just read and read and read, and then obviously was using a lot of strategies in my teaching, and um, read a lot, a lot about approaches. A particularly kind of um, uh, stringent approaches, particularly coming maybe from America, such as ABA and so forth. And, yeah, I, th- um, I think a lot of a lot of a lot of listeners all know um, what you know what you're talking about. And it really wasn't for me, and I just thought actually we have to go from the child and just strip back and know what the child needs and how we relate. So it was more of a relational approach to parenting and to... Which is how you parent anyway, and, like with... Yeah, it was more explicit to everything we did. We made it explicit. You don't do this because... When we're here, we do this because... and. We taught you with DMs because one day I said to you, you know, oh, you money puts a hole in your pocket, Tom, and you jumped a mile. So we taught you because you were very literal. So we taught you a lot about <laughs> idioms. So we did everything very literally. No cats and dogs. Kind of cats Raining cats and, and dogs. dogs. <laughs> Absolutely. So we were kind of... Um, I think you have to settle into your own flow, and I know... I wanted you. I said to you one day, well, actually, no, you were in your bunk bed and you said to me, Mum, would you change me? Would you take my autism away? Which was a really random question. I think you were about 12. It's a very deep question it to was. ask. It. it was a really deep question and you just threw me, really. And of course, I was like, no, because you wouldn't be you. You know, you wouldn't be Tom. And why would I change you just like your brother? Mm. Why I think would I change your brother? You know, you are my family. And I, I think that, that, that's You're just amazing. like, so. it's just, it's something that I think, it, you know, I think that, that sort of mm. approach mm. was was quite important for me. I mean, I, I went through stages mm. of like, absolutely mm. hating autism mm. and myself and I kind of blamed a lot on it. But I think, 
you know, you're right. It's like if you if you make someone not autistic, you're changing their brain. Like mm-hmm. they're not the same person. Like the the reason why I'm so keen for like pers- uh, identity first language and things like that because you know it's it's not like I've lost an arm and I used to have an arm and it's something that you know it's it, it's I guess it's somewhat a part of my identity in a, in a sense but like it's not as so tied to who I am as like something about about my brain that's different it's not a disease it's no. not a disease is it no. you know it's it's a different way of wiring different way of looking at things and it's a really useful way of looking at the world as well through a different lens it really is and we were talking the other night weren't we about normal we were like yeah yeah there really shouldn't be a word called normal because there are so many different variations. You know, we're all unique. We all have a fingerprint. Hmm. We're all different. We're all unique. So what is normal? You know, how yeah. do you define that? It really shouldn't be a word, should it? No. But and it, I, I, think, I think there's two ways of kind of looking at it. I mean, <clears throat> I find normal to be a very negative term. It is. Like, I, I agree. Normal is not a compliment or a no. validation. No. Like... The, the most, you know, peop- you want people to be interesting and to have different views on things mm-hmm. and to be able to add something to, like, the melting pot of humanity. It's not like, like, if we we're all the exact same person, we would never get anywhere with things. Like, and a lot of, like, the big visionaries and stuff in the world, you know, they, they're often different um, from from most most people. Um and I think for for me, a lot of like my mentality around it is that, you know, I I see we- being strange and weird as and quirky as a good thing. Like it breaks up the normality of a boring everyday life, and it allows you to, you know, if if you meet someone who's vastly different from yourself, it's it can often be quite illuminating to like see how they like look at the the world and what they think about things and how they behave. It's um I do I do you know because I think there is a stereotype around like autistic people being really fascinated with like objects and things like but I I I really kind of I didn't really identify with that kind of thing because I, I remember like reading stuff from like Temple Grandin talking about you know we're, we're more fascinated by objects than than people but I, I've always, I don't know if it's something that you you saw, but I've always been incredibly, like, fascinated with understanding how other people work. Like, well, I think you've always kind of had that need to understand other people and unpick them, and that's been a big motivator in you developing your social skills. But I hmm. think not all people have that. But it's just like we're always told, you know, you teach one person, but one child with autism, you teach one child mm. with autism, mm. you know, everybody is so different. Yeah. But um but I think sort of the things you're doing and the things you're talking about, you know, if you don't have those difficult conversations and kind of challenge things, mm. people never change their thinking. So it's good to challenge and it's good to kind of talk about things that might be really difficult, you know, and kind of promote that and strike a conversation and a discussion about it. Mm. Mm. <clears throat> Is there anything else that you wanted to add about the difficulties or Yeah, and I think it's a common one for a lot of parents to uh, sleep. So oh, this, yeah. So oh. when you were a baby you were very routine and you slept beautifully. Yeah. But as you got older, obviously I didn't know about melatonin at the time, but um, it's such a big thing with autism. It's isn't a it? huge thing, but you would go to sleep, you wouldn't go to sleep. You struggled to drop off to sleep once you were asleep, you were okay. Yeah. It was it's the same off. same in adulthood as well. Yeah, so um used to kind of lay on the bed with you, but you were very sensory. <laughs> Is it okay to talk about this? Go for it if you so, want. <laughs> so Thomas would always grab it, whether it was me or his dad, I would always grab your mouth. 
and kind of squeeze and squeeze and squeeze your lips. And it must be a sensory thing that it would eventually just drop off to sleep. And it was, I mean, it went on for years and years. <laughs> and it's only in your teenage years, really, that you got prescribed melatonin. And yeah. it helped for a short time, but it's not long lasting. And you still no. struggle with your sleep, mm. don't you? And we've tried everything, haven't we, really? Yeah, it's just. So, I think it's because I'm so wired, like I'm so cerebral about everything that I do. Like, if I stop doing things and try to like relax in like the typical way, I just get really ang- irritable and bored. And like, it's like my my entire day from waking up till till, till the evening. It's like I'm always thinking about something <laughs> yeah, and, and doing something. And when it comes time to sleep, it's like I can't really break out of that that kind of way of being uh, to a point where my brain calms down and that I that I fall asleep but I mean I I think I think for me like the most the things that helped me a lot were having something to focus on that didn't require me to think really Mm -hmm. so I still have like somewhat of a focus on it it's like nowadays I'll you know turn my phone down to the lowest bright brightness and um, turn on like the the orange light stuff, the the night screen thing on my on my phone, and just like watch a video or play like a mindless game, and that's that seems to help a lot. Um, I I, th- I think that's probably reflected in a lot of things in life, mm-hmm. like the way that you know, like they, they say a lot about you know, go with the flow, go with your gut. Never worked for me. <laughs> Hey up YouTube, just popping on to say if you have enjoyed this podcast clip so far, why not check out the full episode which you can find on my YouTube channel, on Spotify, Google, Apple, pretty much anywhere that you would want to find it. And if you have enjoyed this, please make sure to like, uh, drop me a subscribe if you want to see more stuff from me, and drop a comment down below because it really does help with the algorithm. Other than that, you can check out my Instagram which is in the link tree down below in all of my videos. There's daily blogs, weekly updates on the podcast, and lots of other stuff that you won't find here on YouTube. Hope you've enjoyed this clip, and I'll let you get back to it. It, it almost always causes me a lot of distress, mm. and it just doesn't work. It's too, uh, it's too loose. It's, it's not literally the other. It's not. Got it's, of it's also ba- based on emotion mm. as well. I know. I, I think around, especially when I was younger, I didn't trust it at all. Like I, I remember looking at like my friends and people around me and just thinking Mm. i mean socially you know i was behind but i could still recognize that like some of the behaviors that people were doing and like how they just did stuff because they felt like doing it or they just instantly did things and i found that really confusing Mm -hmm. like i didn't understand why Mm -hmm. people did stuff without thinking and knowing why they're doing it thinking it through yeah and I know you never switch off because even when you're in the bathroom, you're always listening to research or yeah, yeah. audible, aren't you? Yeah. You never stop, really. You're always working and then you get the burnout. There. That's the only drawback, isn't it? Mm. It's the burnout, the sensory overload sometimes when you go to events and so forth and you mm. you do really well and you've um, socialised really 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 well and you know you have a good time but in the next day you're just wiped out yeah. completely yeah you? that you social need, battery absolutely and you just need to have that downtime and people need to understand that partners families just need to not take it so personally really mm. it's not that they don't want to talk to you it's just that actually yeah you just need that that almost that reset isn't it well, we have like a, a friend of the family who's like um, has like an autistic autistic daughter, and I absolutely mm-hmm. love her. And mm-hmm. you know, whenever whenever we mm-hmm. interact or something, we'll have probably like an hour where we'll chat and stuff. But then after a while, we'll just kind of yeah. sit, just sit in silence and just like yeah. play with some metal or watch something. That's, or yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. It's kind of, it's it's interesting, like with that, because it's I feel like some parents they feel like they have to do stuff all the time or they have mm-hmm. to teach them all the time or get get them involved and be like really on top of them and stuff mm-hmm. and i think sometimes they you know obviously like a lot of the time the best approach is to kind of 
you know, tr- try and ex- help them um, experience different things, but also, you know, feel okay to to withdraw and, and pull back when when you need to. Yeah, sometimes you just need to back off and stop mm. talking. And a lot of teachers find that with autistic children, that like when they're having a meltdown, they do more. They say more. They just, ask them questions. Yeah, they, it's like sh- more people come around than. <laughs> So, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, that's like really that actually, interesting. Actually, just back off. Yeah. They're kicking you because they want you to move away and they can't verbally say it at that point. So, yeah, it's really important. Yeah. It's really, it's really interesting mm-hmm. as well when I went to these special needs teaching and stuff. Like, obviously, mm-hmm. in some areas, I wasn't yeah. so good with, um, you know, because I just didn't have the experience with mm-hmm. teaching kids and mm-hmm. no understanding, like, um, I think I found it really hard with the thing that I found really hard with teaching is being more authoritarian, like in the yes. way that I that I act. Mm-hmm. Um, I found that really hard to do. But I, I remember like there's been quite a few times when, you know, perhaps a, a kid that I was working with who, um, you know, they were struggling with mm. something and, and the, the way that they dealt with it was mm. by going towards them and, and separating them from people. Mm-hmm. Whereas what I really tried to do with them was to say that, look, okay, most kids, they're not allowed to go out of the mm-hmm. playground and go to this area, but it is quieter. Does it help you? And mm-hmm. is it, does it sound better? Or like, you know, when I saw that they were getting overwhelmed, I was like, do you want to go to the to that area that we go to? And they just kind of sit and they, they count like the stones on the pavement and, you know, um, regulate themselves Get and it, some order back, yeah. yeah but also also making them aware of what how how what they're doing is helping their emotional state as well because i think mm. there is a tendency sometimes mm. with autistic kids to try and um take the reins a little bit with stuff mm. rather than like teaching them how to do mm. how to like regulate themselves and and what to do and mm. like you know another thing introduce uh, stimming to them mm. like some some uh, you know, that quite often you have situations where teachers all try and suppress their stims, um, but m- more often it's they, they don't introduce things. It's not like they go and say, hey, would you like a vidya? Or should we get some lights for the classroom? Or should we make like a, a sensory den? Or like they, they don't have that like proactive understanding. They're just they're thinking about all oh, the schedule, the school schedule. We have to get this piece of work done by then and you know, or but... not wanting the child to look different. We used to get told a lot, we don't want to make them look different. It's like, I am different. we're all different <laughs> and this helps me. And I think it was really interesting what you were talking about with the emotional coaching. That's a really powerful way of getting children to identify their feelings and regulate them mm. more. By just, li- again, be literal and commenting and saying, I can see you look tense. Yeah. I can yeah. see you, you're shaking, or I can see you're kicking because you want me to go away, and that's because maybe you're angry or maybe you feel frustrated. Yeah. You know, and labelling the emotions so that actually they can do something with that and they start to connect. Yeah, what do we, what do, we do when we feel this? We do, exactly. you do this, that helps you, that helped you last time. So we try mm-hmm. that one. And, mm-hmm. Yeah. I think that's important. It's very powerful, isn't it? It's Mm. a really powerful thing to do rather than just suppressing everything. Mm. Yeah, actually giving it a label and a name. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. 